so we're going to get started. So let me just, I'm going to do a little intro to this wonderful man that has before me. This is Michael Jager. Welcome. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Oh, thank you so much for being here. And I'm just going to give a little introduction so those that um, have joined can really understand who you are. I know they would have read it in our event um, page as well, but we're going to we're just going to remind them all. So Michael J. Gelb is a pioneering practitioner and a thought leader in the fields of creative thinking, executive coaching and conscious leadership. He is the author of 17 books, including How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, The Art of Connection, The Healing Organization and The Mastering of the Art of Public Speaking. Michael's books have been translated into 25 languages and have been sold more than 1 million copies, which is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. In 2003, Michael received a Bateman Fellowship in Innovation, in innovation from the University of Virginia and co-directed the acclaimed Leading Innovation Seminar at the Darden Graduate School of Business for more than 10 years. In 2020, he was invited to become a Senior Fellow of the Centre of Humanistic Management at Fordham's Gabriel School of Business. Um, Gabelli School of Business, pardon me. Michael is also a master teacher of the Alexander Technique and I'm not going to say, say this right, am I? A Aikido? Am I saying that right, Michael? Is well it done, well done, yes. Oh, thank you. Aikido and Qigong, and Qigong and a professional juggler who performed with the Rolling Stones. Wow. I mean, that's quite a CV, Michael. <laughs> 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 that's incredible. So, I mean, all these things, and I say uh, author is sort of one of those main things that you've done here. You know, where did this all start for you? I, I, this is one of the sort of the starting point. Where did all of this kind of curiosity into this, this particular niche area of life, where did it all start for you? It all, it all started because I was just really curious about why we're here, what's the purpose of life, how to make life meaningful. I think every... Every person asks those questions, you're a child and you wonder, where did everything come from? Yeah. What's, what's out in the infinity of space? Yeah. Why is there evil in the world? Uh, what is human nature? Everybody's curious about those things. Uh, but then we get distracted and we go on and focus about on something else mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that becomes our career. But I never, I never went away from those questions. Those questions just continued to uh, motivate me. Uh, so I said, how can I study this? How can I learn about this? And fortunately, I was able to find a way to translate it into a rather unique career. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, can you imagine that just doing something that you find curious doing and then the, and you can then teach people that else to do it? I mean, it's it's quite something. And uh, do you think, like, as I say, because um, you say the curiosity is really what, what led you to it. I'm actually interested. What age were you when you first felt like you first started to get that curiosity coming to you? What age did that kind of start happening for you? I mean, I, on one hand, I'd say always because yeah. I just remember being a little kid and I couldn't sleep at night and I would I would be there and I would be imagining infinity. I'd be trying to imagine infinity. Yeah. And it disturbed me that we were so insignificant in this yeah. vast universe. Yeah. yeah. And really, I was suffering. <laughs> I was suffering. And that's part of what led me to think how do I understand this? How do I create meaning in the face of, of all of this? And then it was a you know, slow process of discovering inspiring resources. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, I was blessed. My, my mother was a psychologist. Oh, perfect. She, she introduced me to the notion of the power of the mind. Yes, yeah. And both my mom and dad were in the healing profession. So I was oriented towards doing something that was healing for myself and for other people. Uh, I never really thought of getting a job per se, or, no. and I didn't really, I was amazingly naive. I didn't even think about making money. I just, I just thought find some way to help other people in a manner that relates to something that I'm really interested in. Yeah. And so I just, you know, it's one step to, an, I, I, one of the first things I fell in love with uh, and, and learned how to do was, was to juggle. Literally, yeah. I became, yeah. 
I became, I, I just thought this is something I'm so interested in. And I, I studied it and got really good at it and started juggling at children's parties. And I used to work in a club in London called the Beef Eater by the Tower. Okay. Juggle yes. at the door. Wow. And greet the tourists who would come in. Uh, uh, I would. I had a court jester's outfit. And it was you know, one of these Henry the Eighth theme places. Yeah. And I, I would say, I would greet them at the door. I'd be juggling. I'd say, "Good evening, lords and ladies. <laughs> Welcome to the Beef Eater by the Tower. <laughs> May I squat you to a low room?" And then, so, and then they were usually Americans. And then they'd sit down. I'd say. Have a great time, folks. Amazing. I said, hey, you're American. Uh, so, and then I, then of course I juggled uh, with Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones Gosh, wow. and with Bob Dylan. Uh, and so when you went, when you said I wanted to become a juggler, you, you really meant that, didn't you? You really took it the, the whole length, the length to go <laughs> juggle for the Rolling Stones. Well, I, again, I, I had no idea that I would ever, at that point, that I would ever get paid for juggling. Wow. I mean, so you can see that. Can you see the letters on this ball? Just yes. It says I'm, IBM, I'm, right? Yeah. You've heard of that company? Uh huh. Yeah. Because this is one of the juggling balls from when I taught 10, uh, a thousand uh, uh, IBM managers how to juggle. Wow. And I've done this for companies all over the world. And I had no idea when I was 19 years old and just passionate about learning how to juggle that I would juggle for the Rolling Stones or that I would write a book about juggling is a metaphor for uh, team building and accelerating the learning process. And that I would, I would be doing this for the rest of my life all over the world. Wow. No idea. I just followed what I really love to do. Yeah. And I was blessed that it's all, it's all worked out. Wow. Oh my goodness. I love that because it's such that it that just plays on the fact that as I say you go with something that you love to do the joy that kind of brings that anyway and you follow that and you see the world respond to that as you as you as you follow that in, in yourself and that's really having that connection to to yourself and doing doing what you need to do in order to facilitate your life in in that way so interestingly so the main sort of book that obviously we, we're kind of going to talk about today is to how to think like da Vinci now why is it why do you think it is that this particular book was your bestseller it's gone you know it's been the most popular one out of all of all of the ones that you've done i think it's because leonardo da vinci is a global archetype of human potential right i think it's because people all around the world resonate with the idea of the uomo universale the universal human uh -huh. So he embodies our yearning to express our talents and abilities because he seemed to express more human talent and ability than anyone who's, who's ever lived. So I think there's a romantic and inspiring, uplifting quality. Yeah. Uh, that that touches people on a deep on a soul level mm. and you know i just asked this very simple question mm. what is he trying to teach us what what is his message for humanity today yeah and i went through his notebooks i read them all over and over again with just asking that question what's the message for us today and leonardo is very clear in his notebooks he gives advice to his students on how to develop their creativity on how to develop their human potential mm -hmm. so i just took what leonardo said to his mm -hmm. students and translated it into contemporary terms and then gave it structure in terms of how do you actually apply this yeah in your life in your life today yeah 100% because I think that's a big part of it as well is that you know the you receive all this information because nowadays I mean look look at the way that we are we've got information at our fingertips we can get anything we want um, in terms of information but I think a lot of it you know comes in from this perspective of you you've got all this information but then how do you actually you know how do you integrate it how do you actually live into this how do you actually embody this kind of information because it's an overload 
and you only we you know what we've been learned to over the years is to kind of think about this and is to only is to hold it kind of here and you know we're analyzing it and and almost getting anxiety about all these things um and instead of actually embodying it so um you know from 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 this is this the sort of thing that you're you, you teach in your books and, and what you speak about you know embodying this kind of way of being and actually living it because living it and learning it is is two very different things that's that's beautifully stated because it's e many people have an academic knowledge mm. plenty of academic books written about leonardo by people yeah. who have no clue how to actually embody yeah uh, what he's trying to teach us and what he's trying to teach us is how to live a more beautiful life yeah how to help other people have a more beautiful life and you know that's what a small world is all about as far yeah. as i understand it exactly. so how do we have a more beautiful life yeah and here's history's greatest genius giving us guidance on how to do it yeah so well that's our motto share the good life like that's that's what it's all about you know and uh we do that uh, with being able to globalize it with everybody so so obviously a lot of um in what speak it gets spoken about within uh, the books as well as you know around around this idea of genius now to me the idea of genius you know what is it is it something that everybody has is it something that we all can access or why is it that some people you know feel like they can't access their genius or you know what's your kind of perspective on this it's something that each of us has in our own unique way yeah and one of the secrets of life is to discover your genius it's to discover what are your gifts? What are your talents? Because there's no one like you in all of human history. Yeah. I mean, unless you have an identical twin, your DNA is unique, <laughs> not just of the 7 billion people who are around now, but the approximately 90 billion who've existed in all of human history. Yeah. So it was the great dancer, genius, Martha Graham. There's a wonderful quote from her and to sum it up and paraphrase it, she basically says, there is an energy, a life force, she calls it a quickening. And she says, and it's unique to you. And if you don't find it and express it, 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 will, never, it will never come to humanity again. So each of us has this responsibility to find out what is our gift mm. and how do we cultivate it? Mm. The problem is that when you go to school, and university, school and university aren't usually focused or organized around helping you fulfill your full human potential. Mm -hmm. They're mostly organized around getting you to take your place in a bureaucracy or an assembly line. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're going against the wave of a lot of so-called education. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be a huge job for, you know, you imagine, I think this is probably why, because as well, you know, it would be a huge job for teachers to be able to individualize every single thing for each, each child, because it is so, and like you say, we're all so unique. And how would you even go about like teaching that? But I think uh, from you know from what I, uh, the understanding of what I've I've learned sort of over the years is is about self-awareness is about you know uh, teaching self-awareness teaching children to be able to basically be in tap, touch and in tap with who they are and how that kind of gets displayed you know and, and projected and and expressed to the world again brilliantly stated because that's a huge missing link in education at all levels Mm -hmm. is self-awareness and self-management they go together those are the two elements of intrapersonal intelligence and then interpersonal intelligence awareness mm -hmm. of others and the ability to empathize and work effectively with other people and it turns out that that together intrapersonal and interpersonal intelligence make up what we call emotional intelligence yeah and that's the greatest correlate of a fulfilling and happy life. Yeah. Uh, but we don't teach it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do not. We teach it. We don't. I think 
one of the things that I heard in, in a past interview that you did as well before, um, which I, I love this and it stuck with me actually, you know how things just stick and they stuck with me. And this one didn't, you mentioned about, because for me, it's something that I've always understood around that people don't ask enough questions in life. Like we don't ask enough questions. And something you said was that at school, we don't get taught to ask questions. We get taught to, to, to answer them. Like we need to be able to, you know, you get that pressure of being out going, uh, you know, you have to answer the question rather than ask the question. They say, you know, ask questions or whatever, but there's also this big emphasis and pressure on being, getting it right, you know, getting the answer right. And I thought that was such a, it, it just dawned on me when you said it. And I thought, well, absolutely, absolutely. That that happens in schools. And, and when that pressure is applied uh, from what you were saying and before, you know, with creativity and, and how can you be in a creative state if you know all the answers already? And there's some kinds of, there's some areas where it's important to know the right answer. Yes, yeah. Uh, it, it's important to know arithmetic. Mm. It's important to know spelling and grammar. Mm. And there are right answers in a lot of areas and it's really good to know them. So the problem is that we get so focused on teaching children to just get those answers that in the process we frequently shut down their real curiosity which is their birthright of genius mm. their imagination their creativity mm. and it's not it's not an either or and this is part of why leonardo is such a perfect role model for us mm. because the fifth principle for thinking like leonardo is arte scienza Arte, scienza, balance art and science. Wow. Balance wow. logic and imagination. Yeah. Balance rationality and intuition. It's mm. not an either or. And this is, it's not just Leonardo, the greatest minds in human history mm. are those that have this integration between rigorous discipline, analytical, detailed thinking, and playful, imaginative, colorful, exploratory thinking. And the ability to move harmoniously and freely and appropriately back and forth between those two modalities is one of the characteristics that we can all cultivate. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's, that's part of what I, you know, I help businesses mostly actually do that when it comes to dealing with real challenges Hmm. Uh, you know, how do you write your strategic plan? How do you create an innovative culture? Uh, and, and the ability to actually really think like Leonardo, I'm not kidding. Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. really, really. Embody this man. <laughs> right, helps you be way more intelligent, come up with much wiser, more integrated and sustainable solutions to the challenges in your personal life or your professional life. 100%, 100%. And I think that like you say that creativity. So I, my interesting thought with that is that so much of what you're saying, again, we, we use this word creativity. See, words is a big thing, I think, for, for a lot of this learning and, and debunking of, of ideas of things and, you know, what we've kind of gone with in the world and, and what we understand in the world. And I think when you say creative, you know, everyone needs to be creative. Some people go, well, I'm not creative because they, you know, can you sort of like break down this kind of idea that we've got of this this word and, and what's kind of associated around this word and that, you know, how that can enlighten in everybody? Sure. Well, what I'd like to invite everyone to do, uh, let's go on to the chat. Yeah. I'd love to have people on a scale of one to 10, 10 being your Leonardo da Vinci, your Martha Graham, the highest level of creativity. Yeah. And, and zero is you don't have a creative bone in your body. Yeah. Rank yourself on how creative you are. Ooh, so ooh. From zero to 10, put a number in the chat. Okay, here we go. Wow. We've got eight, three, eight, eight. Great. We've got some people that, you know, definitely are embracing their creativity already. Six, seven, no, 8.5. 7.5, 9, we've got a 9, we've got a 9, <laughs> <laughs> we've got a Leo, we've got a Da Vinci in the room. <laughs> Fantastic, great. Okay, so now here's, and then, you know, some people say, well, 
I used to be creative when I was younger, but then I became less creative uh -huh. when I started graduate school or when I started in the workplace. Some people say, well, my sister was the really creative one in our family. Yeah. A yeah. lot of people, you know, they have a brother and a sister and one is the creative one. The other is the logical one. Yeah, sure. Uh, but wherever you think you are on the scale, yeah. that's not really the important question. Mm. The important question is the next one I'm about to, to put to everybody, which is, do you think it's possible to become more creative? Do you think it's and and so then so let me know in the chat you could say uh, no you're that's just the way you are so you could say no you could say maybe or you could say yes of course so let's see okay no maybe it's yes like, I, don't, of course. I don't know there yes yes maybe always a hundred percent that's what we like a hundred percent yes <laughs> <laughs> well, so excellent. Well, clearly we have we have a fabulous group of folks who totally get it, and that's what probably why they're here. But I actually, it, I've I've earned a lot of my living in the course of just the last forty years. Yeah. When companies have hired me to go into people who think they're absolutely not creative and that there's no way they can be, mm -hmm. and to teach them that they can be and show them how they 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 will become that, and then they do. Yeah. Uh, but wherever you are, even if you think you're a nine, how cool would it be to become a 9.5? 100%, yeah. And if you're a seven, become an eight and whatever you are. So here's what we know, research-based, uh, this is mostly uh, from research uh, from Stanford University. Uh, first of all, it helps to think of yourself as creative mm. because if you can just get people to change their self-concept from I'm not so creative, Mm -hmm. So I might be creative. Their scores on creativity tests go up 25%. Wow. Now it's common sense because if you think you're not creative, you don't look for creative solutions. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. If you think maybe I am kind of creative, you say, well, what would a creative solution be? So you're more likely to find it. Yeah. But the most important thing to understand is that these are skills you can develop. There are the skill of, for example, mental fluency, which is the ability to think of lots of ideas. Hmm. It's something you can cultivate. It's something I teach people in my seminars. You can learn it reading the book. It, it's, it's not hard. Yeah. Uh, you just never learned it in school. Uh, and then like you course, just write something. It's what you, you we, we only go through that limit of what I know. You know, it's that you leave no space for I don't know. And then you leave no space. And I don't know is the beginning of everything creative. Exactly. That's what the Mona Lisa is smiling about. That's why her smile is so mysterious. Yeah. Because it's uh, that sense of, you know, the curiousness, the knowing of that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that I, that came up for me as well, this was this thought of, again, so you know, Da Vinci's been around for, what was it? About 500 years, is it? Is it 500 years? And, you know, this concept that we're, you're talking about, and it's something of this new age of, you know, it's really been blasted open now. And in, in you see so many people are really jumping on board with the self-awareness and, and this kind of like self-development, self-empowering, all these aspects of life. So Da Vinci was speaking about this stuff 500 years ago. Why has it taken so long <laughs> for us to kind of like catch up with this or even get take a grip of the idea because you know what you said as well you went through his notebooks and you did all of that because you wanted to um can put it into a contemporary sort of format so that people could now understand of it of course because there were probably the elements of it that were slightly outdated of, of kind of where evolution was at where da vinci was around but saying that these concepts are still very simple and they are also very relevant like to now so why why yes. is it taking us 500 years to still you know, for, for us as human beings to awaken. Today. Well, human beings actually have always been awakened human beings from every culture everywhere in the world. Yeah. And these wisdom traditions from India, from China, from Africa, from Latin America, from the original people who lived uh, where I live here, mm -hmm. uh, from every every culture, there were people who, who knew the most important things to know about 
being human. Yeah. And in Western culture, this sense of contemplating what Socrates called the examined life uh, was essential to education, essential to for every citizen to possess and, and pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know, the Romans and the Stoics, uh, this is a huge part of, of their tradition. I'm just, just talking about the West because we could, we could it's, yeah. We've got we to do a whole great session that. talking about yeah. yes, the other world. <laughs> but if we just take the, the, the West, uh, and you then have, you have, I'll take you through it really quickly. Yeah. You have a thousand years of the Middle Ages, uh, AKA the Dark Ages, where that basic curiosity and the basic sense of the nobility of the individual uh, was, was somewhat lost and obscured. It was believed for that time that all knowledge was vested above. Mm. Uh, hence the, the design of the magnificent Gothic cathedrals, mm. which I still, I mean, I love it. Chartres Cathedral, the Dome Cathedral in Cologne. Uh, uh, the, you walk into one of these and you feel insignificant mm. because the architectural message is everything is up there, you're nothing. And you can't even talk directly up there. You have to go through these folks up there on this higher place so they can send your message yeah, yeah. up there and if, if we look at uh, the paintings of the middle ages we see that they're flat that they're two-dimensional and they're exclusively of holy figures because again the idea is the only thing worth paying any attention to was the angelic realms hence the halos they're beautiful they're amazing i love it yeah. Uh, I love seeing, I love seeing the evolution of consciousness, but then we get to the Renaissance and art changes, architecture changes. Now, all of a sudden we get uh, the dome of the Florence Cathedral, which gives you this feeling when you walk in there that you're, you're connected to the divine, but you're part of it. You're included in it. Yeah, yeah. You're actually even at the center of it. Mm -hmm. And then we, we go, we go to go to the Brancacci chapel and see one of the first Renaissance paintings uh, by Masaccio. Uh, ironically, it's Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden. But you look at it, and it's one of the first paintings that's in three dimensions. Mm. And you know, how would you feel if you were expelled from the garden? You'd probably be pretty upset about it. Well, Adam and Eve are showing real human emotion, mm. which you did not see mm. In those two dimensional halo paintings, because they weren't of humans, they weren't of you and me. So, the message, the powerful message of the Renaissance, in very simple terms, mm. is that divine spark of the creative is in every one of us. Mm. Right? So, and, and, and Leonardo embodies this more than anyone, but there are many others uh, who, who express this uh, Michelangelo, Raphael, uh, phenomenal. The parade of geniuses in other countries. You know, there's Albrecht Durer. There's so many great uh, intelligences that express this uh, connection to the divine spark of creativity. But if you look, uh, the world was still governed. The rulers were kings and queens and potentates and czars and shahs. So that the, the structure of society still said, you average person are nothing. Yeah. So we had to go through the enlightenment mm. where we have all of a sudden writers and philosophers saying, wait a minute, shouldn't there be uh, equal rights? Shouldn't there be human rights uh, if everybody has this creative spark? So then you, know, you get to the 18th century where for the first time that notion is actually expressed in the founding document of a nation, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness being inalienable rights. And that's become a global, a global yearning that we, we all know this, that this, yeah, human dignity, the individual is sacred. We have to protect individual rights and, and build societies that, that help people realize their, their value and the value of others. Uh, so it's, it's 
in the flourishing of the notion of human rights that we get this opportunity to then have the freedom and the safety to have the real luxury to explore who we really are and develop all our creative abilities. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's a beautiful way of putting it. Wow. And I mean, again, it's, it's, it's been such a journey in order to be able to kind of get to that place now, hasn't it? And, and as I say, we're in a, we're very lucky in a sense now, although life is very fast paced of where we are at, we are very lucky to be able to kind of be in this position where we can have that um, and there not be as much govern. Well, um, it's interesting. That's an interesting topic, but uh, as much governing, I would say, you know, uh, around there. But there are, I would feel there is a slight more freedom. There is more empowerment. There is more that an individual feels more that they can stand up and, and they can do something about it. You know, so for so many people that are listening, you know, people that are probably uh, wanting as well to unlock more of this creativity, to unlock that part of themselves. What would you give them as sort of the first step into kind of doing that, into cre developing that? Well, I, I'll give you the simplest thing. It's just a real practical one thing. You want to do something right away to be more creative. Yeah. yeah. I'll start by asking everybody a question. And actually, people can put it in answers in the chat. Perfect. Where are you physically located when you get your very best ideas? Where are you actually physically located when you get your best ideas? Put your answer in the chat, please. Wow. Oh, yeah, in a, on a plane, running, in a bed, on the sea, shower. It can be anywhere, no particular place, walking with other people, trying to go to sleep, in the bed or exercising. Interesting, interesting. Super, great. Yeah. On a train, I love, yeah. Yeah. I love train rides for just this reason. Really? So I've been asking this question to people throughout my whole career. The number one answer around the world is in the shower or the bath. Yeah. Uh, also resting in bed. Yeah. Uh, walking in nature, driving the car or on a train or on a plane. Yeah. Uh, after yoga or meditation for a lot of people these days. Mm -hmm. Most people get their best ideas when they're by themselves and yeah. when they're relaxed. Some people are different. Some people get their best ideas in the midst of conversation, but that's, that's rare. Usually people have the conversation. Then they go home and take the nap or the shower or drink the glass of wine and then they get the aha idea. Yeah. But wherever you are, the simple practical tip is keep a little notebook with you wherever you go especially at the place where you are when you get your best ideas mm -hmm. and when you get them write them down yes yeah so this is direct advice from leonardo da vinci to his students he tells his students carry a little notebook with you when you get your ideas write them down we look at leonardo's notebooks bill gates paid 30.8 million dollars for 72 pages of leonardo's notebooks in 19 94. Really? Right. Wow. right. Leonardo's notebooks uh, uh, have lots of creative doodles. Uh, uh, they're on all sorts of different subjects. He goes from one to another. They're not organized. So if, if, if I told you, as I just have, that mm. probably history's greatest genius, Leonardo da Vinci says, keep a notebook, write down your ideas, you'd probably say, okay, cool. But what if I also told you that that's exactly what Thomas Edison told the people who worked in his laboratory? Right. And in Thomas Edison's notebooks, uh, he got the ideas for 1,093 individual United States patents oh. right, and created three entirely new industries. Yeah, so notebook is definitely worth it. <laughs> right, and then uh, uh, Mozart. Well. Mozart, from the time he was five years old, just wrote down his musical ideas in his notebooks. And he would go to a concert and he would hear something uh, and he would, he would just write down mm. He didn't, they weren't that organized. They weren't filed. They were just write it down. Because yeah. here's, here's the average person. It's four o'clock in the morning, let's say. They wake up and they have a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. And they think, I'm no genius. I'm going back to sleep. Yeah. But Leonardo da Vinci or Marie Curie 
or Mozart wakes up at four o'clock in the morning with a crazy idea, they write it down in their notebook. So that's the simplest practice yeah. that can change your life if you start to do it regularly. Yeah, exactly. And you know, nowadays, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm thinking quite practically here, if you're in the shower, you know, it's it's not, you know, the why it's, it's, it's going to get wet and things like that. So you've got to keep it outside. Just you've got to make the effort to kind of write outside of the shower if you're running. Because this was my biggest thing. I Because one of my mine is I always get ideas at night. Like just as I'm about to sleep, like I sleep, I wake up all of a sudden. It all starts dawning on me. Recently, I was just on a plane. Oh, my goodness. Consciousness completely opened up to me. I was on a plane. <laughs> Great. And then, and then the other one is running. I always get it a lot of the time when I'm, I start channeling when I'm running and I'm, and I'm like, okay, how, you know, how do I write this down like this? And, 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 but you've got your phone, you can do like voice notes or, you know, that sort of thing. You've just got to, you've just got to make the effort, like you say, to do it because, um, and I'm going to take that advice because I don't do it enough. I think, oh, I'll remember it. And then I don't, and then it's gone. But see, this is the, you're exactly right. And it's, it's the, it's having the intention. Yeah. Because what this does, see, Every culture, we have people who, who probably have different first languages beyond English mm. with us. So think about whatever your first language is. How in that language do they say, because I bet they say it, I knew it in my gut. Yeah. My, my bones whispered to me or my blood spoke to me or I, I, my heart of hearts told me it was true. Mm. So here's the problem mm -hmm. your bones your heart your gut and your blood don't send you text messages or emails they whisper to you mm. when you are in this receptive state yeah when you are awakening or in the shower so when you start to keep the notebook and you form this intention you are inviting this quieter but wiser aspect of yourself to have a voice which is also by the way one of the other great commonalities that many of the geniuses that i've studied have and one of the recommendations they give to their students which leonardo does specifically in multiple times in his notebooks is walk in nature if you have something to work on, if you have an issue or a challenge or a problem, walk. I, I, when every day the weather allows, I walk. I'm pointing that way because that's that's where the Rockefeller State Preserve is. Yeah, it's twice the size of Central Park. Wow. And the carriage trails go past streams, and there's a blue heron who lives in that stream over there. Okay. I love spotting him when he's ah. just peering up to. Go catch one of the <laughs> trout that live there. And you know, people, here's, here's the thing is, uh, this is stuff I really actually do. Mm. People say, how do you write so many books? How do you do all this stuff? I practice what's in the books. Yeah. So, do you know, I actually, I go for right. a walk and whatever issue or problem or challenge or difficulty I have, and I have issues, problems and challenges, difficulties, just like everybody else, mm -hmm. but they solve themselves when I walk. Mm. Takes about an hour yeah. for me. <laughs> and I think we're all different, you know, like whatever yeah. the problem might be and connect, connecting back to, because when you do that, you're becoming very, very present all of a sudden. You get out of your mind, you get out of all that self-doubt that you're in and everything that kind of fills and stops you from doing any of this stuff, believing it. Because I think the biggest part with the creativity element of this is, is, is is the self-worth element of that is that people are do not feel that they have it they don't that they think that their idea is not good enough and you know so much of that obviously comes from um you know certain ways of learning things through life through conditioning and programming that we've had as children and growing up and you know in, in schools like you said there's so much more about so much more pressure on answering the question than there is asking it you know and i think you know coming back around to that that part as well is that questioning you know how important is it to make to to ask the right questions in life very much so very very it's it's supremely important and you, you raise a very powerful issue which is self-worth mm, mm. because many many unfortunately sadly many people are effectively abused by being told that they're not smart or they're not good looking or they're not 
coordinated. Mm -hmm. And so we grow up, sadly, buying into these, I call them, I can't, these, these things where we feel we're not capable. Yeah. Uh, and in my own case, I believe that I, I, because I was traumatized in school multiple times on multiple issues, I thought I couldn't draw, I thought I couldn't sing. Uh, and I learned, oh, I also thought I couldn't swim. I had a counselor camp throw me in the deep end of the swimming pool and I almost drowned when I was a kid. So I had a lot of traumatic experiences yeah. with bad teachers and coaches yeah. to whom I'm eternally grateful uh, because when I, when I was in my early 20s, I decided as I got interested in the, the mind and learning and, and healing and self-awareness, I thought, I'm going to go back and learn all the things that I was told I was no good at and I would never be able to do. Yeah. And you know, I learned I, sw I swam a mile. I sang at a concert uh, for professional singers. Uh, I, I learned to draw and had fun with it. And then I, you know, I realized I could learn anything I wanted to. Yeah. And that, that was one of the most empowering things because no one had ever taught me how to learn. Mm. So I became passionate about not just learning how to learn for myself, but helping others learn how to learn. Yeah. And so a big part of my work has been how do you teach people this core skill of learning how to learn? Wow, that's hit me. That was another one that's just hit me because we don't get taught how to learn. We just get taught to learn. Like, you, that's, I mean, that's just like, woo, awaken. Wow. No, that's, that is so pivotal. And I, oh my goodness like because for me that that's opened up a whole different you know and a whole different layer of that you know if we're taught how to learn how to how to learn then we're going to learn a lot more effectively <laughs> you know and and in a way that's going to be very you know uh opening for us to be able to do i mean that's I, that's just blown my mind the way that you've just said that it's just opened up that whole uh, that whole kind of paradigm that's around that that's incredible um so another part as well that is around um from what davinci is uh, speaking about is that it's not just about the mind and the create, you know, the creative, what we speak about a lot of, um, you know, he used to, he was an athlete and he would really respect his body. What is your take on the body and mind um, and how that all comes in together, how that encompasses everything? Well, there's an ancient classical saying, uh, uh, men sane corpore sano, a sound mind and a sound body. Yeah. And we've, what we've learned is we can't really separate mind and body. It's a, it's a, it's a false construct. Mm -hmm. There's a neurological component to every experience. And we can't say what causes what. Mm -hmm. It's not, we don't know that it's causal, but we, we, we do know in practical terms, in really practical terms if you sit like this yeah it's really hard to be happy yeah it's very true and if you sit like this <laughs> it's really hard to be depressed <laughs> i mean it's it's I mean, you say i saw on, on the ted talk and i think it's amy cuddy talks about the the uh the power stance and when you stand in that power stance like that for, for a good two minutes, like it's like a practice you do in the morning, in the morning like this, and you feel your whole body change, everything kind of changes because your physiology is, has changed. Well, Amy Cuddy's uh, researchers did a great job of bringing this to people's attention. Yeah. But you know, the Qigong masters, the Taiji masters, the Aikido masters, the yoga adepts, the Alexander Technique teachers yeah. have all understood this for a really long time and have worked out ways that are a lot more sophisticated than just standing like yeah. Superman for two yeah. minutes. So, so what I counsel people is find whatever one of those disciplines appeals to you the most and make yeah. it a regular practice. 100%, yeah. 
hundred percent. I just want to just add, if anyone has got any questions, because we're just um, teetering now on towards the end of the interview. Um, so if you've got any questions, please pop them in the Q&A. We've got a couple there. So I think um, it'd be nice to start with those. Um, so uh, the first question we have, but yeah, just pop it in because we're, we're going to answer those now for you. So this question is from Chris and he said, how do you recommend people learn how to juggle? What online resources are there? I have a goal to learn to juggle this year. What would what advice would you give to Chris? Bro, I'm gonna teach him right now. How about that? <laughs> oh my god, I love it. <laughs> so I saw this guy juggle many years ago and I wanted to to learn it, but he was not as good a teacher as he was a juggler. Because you know what he told me? He said, take three, throw them up, don't let any of them drop. <laughs> <laughs> which of course led to failure after failure. Of course. But then I, I said, there must be a better way. Yeah. I realized the better way is to just start with one and okay. get really comfortable with one. Then you're going to do two, but don't even try to catch them. Just throw one, two, let them drop. Stand over your better couch, let them drop. Then throw one, two, catch the first one, let the second one drop. Then you'll be ready to throw one, two and catch them both. Then two balls in one hand, one in the other, throw one, two, three, let them all drop. Don't even try to catch them. Then throw one, two, three, catch one, one, two, three, catch two, one, two, three. The third one lands in your hand, you just juggle. Okay. And the, the detailed instructions for this are in how to think like Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. And if, and if people go to my website, michaelgeld.com, there are videos of me teaching this that are free, so. Oh, perfect. I'm sure, I'm sure, Chris, you're going to be learned by the end of this year, for sure, for sure. It might not even be the end of the year. It could be, it could be a lot quicker. <laughs> the, real secret is, the real secret is focus on the throw and your own poise rather than grasping after the balls. I mean, like you say, that is just a, uh, like a, a symbol of like what life is, isn't it? Just focus on, you know, on throwing what you're doing and rather than catching it, which is the end outcome of everything, isn't it? Don't, don't, don't think of the end outcome. Think of the journey instead. Enjoy the journey, experience the journey. Um, the second, oh, we've got someone just saying, hi, Michael, which is nice from Anna. Um, and we've got Sangeeta, which is, what is one of the most important quality that, qualities that hinders creativity? For example, perfectionism. What are the others? The, the number one block to creativity is fear. Fear of making mistakes, fear of getting the wrong answer, fear of looking silly, fear of being perceived as different and thereby not accepted in, in the group. So, so fear in Frank Herbert's classic novel, Dune, he says, fear is the mind killer. Mm. And then the other, the other biggest block to creativity is ignorance, is people haven't learned how to think like Leonardo da Vinci. They haven't been trained to think creatively. So mm. that's the big answer. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Like it's got that perspective shift, hasn't it? It's breaking down of what you know and just allowing something else. And like you say, I think so much of it is still derived on this survival instinct, isn't it? This fear base that, that we kind of operate from and not the, the childlike state that we would love to stay in. Oh dear, I think we've lost you, Michael. You still there? Oh, there you are. There you are. We'd lost you for a second there. You're all good. You're back. You're back. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got another question from Massimo is, don't you think that formal education nowadays relies more on instructions than learning? Sadly, yes. Yeah. Sadly, yes. Do you think there's uh, the, the scope for this to, to start like kind of changing as, as time goes on? I hope, I hope I hope it does. Well, that's part of my mission is oh. uh, I've been working with schools at every level around the world to have uh, how to think like Leonardo da Vinci and the seven da Vinci principles be part of the curriculum. I've had groups of uh, uh, teachers uh, and school administrators from everywhere in the world, uh, from Poland, from Italy, uh, from China and, and, and Japan, from Latin America. I was in Colombia not long ago for, a, for one of the schools there, all over the US. Uh, so there's a big movement of uh, teachers 
uh, and school administrators to get the Da Vinci principles into the school systems. Mm. And I, I also teach all this at uh, business schools. Oh, so wow. that uh, uh, right, we can re reformulate business to be more creative and compassionate and conscious. I mean, that, that, that's a real tackle, isn't it? That's going to be a real tackle, but I'm, I'm sure bit by bit we'll get there. And then we've got the last question here is from Alain, is it Alain or Alain? I'm sorry if I've said that wrong. Um, what do you think made LDV so accomplished? <laughs> I'm guessing that's Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> what do you think made Leonardo da Vinci so accomplished? Was it pure cognitive ability or from his background, his mentors or sponsors? What's your view? There, there's no explanation uh, in, in, we can't say, like for example, Mozart's uh, father was a brilliant composer and musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, his older sister was magnificently gifted and a great singer. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can kind of explain, and, and he grew up at a time where music, the, the zeitgeist of the time made perfectly position him for the kind of music yeah. that he, he created. Mm -hmm. You still can't explain Mozart. That just gives you some clue. But with, with Leonardo, his father was an accountant uh, and his mother was a peasant woman. Wow. Uh, and because Le Leonardo's father wasn't married to his mother, uh, Piero wasn't married to Caterina. Yeah. Leonardo normally would have just been sent to accountancy school, but but children born out of wed wedlock couldn't qualify uh, for the Guild of Accountants. Mm -hmm. So instead, his father sent him to the studio of Verrocchio, where he learned the Renaissance arts. And you know, having said that, there are people who become vessels for the, for the, the spirit of an age, mm. who embody the evolution of human consciousness uh, at a given time. Mm. And many of them we never heard of, they didn't get the breaks, they didn't have the publicists in, in terms of history, yeah. they were from some uh, minority group that was discriminated against. So we never learned about their genius. It's one of the great human tragedies. But the people who have come through to us and who are with us today, thank, thank God there's somebody like Leonardo who is the ultimate Renaissance person, the embodiments of, of, that, of that spirit. Yeah. Or Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson who did the same thing uh, for the Enlightenment. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, and I think there's so many factors in it all, like you were saying, and, and there's always that, that um, the whole, uh, the nature versus nurture kind of uh, aspect of which, which is, which is better, which is what's going to help people even more to kind of be who they are. And I think you have to take that into consideration. You have to understand and be realistic to what we've had and what we've dealt with throughout life. But it's also then becomes your own choice of what it is that you want to do and want to achieve. And, and, and you have to make choices and you have to become aware and then you go with it. You go with whatever works for you. So yeah, that was beautifully, beautifully put. Well, thank you. That has been a wonderful hour of just beautiful chat and, you know, self-awareness and, and, and everything. And everyone's really enjoyed it. It's been loads of interaction, which has been super nice. Um, we love that. And thank you for your comments. Um, we've had the, about the juggling saying that, um, uh, oh no, we had one here. Oh no, that was one of the, um, Sorry, that's a, the same question here. I just thought I'd missed a question, but he's just saying thank you for the advice on the juggling. Um, it's really well put. He said it was, it was really well put there, but thank you everybody so much. We're gonna wrap this up now. Um, thank you, Michael. It has been a wonderful chat and uh, super, super interesting and uh, enlightening as well. So I hope you have a, a lovely rest of your day because it's now it's now the early morning still for you isn't it, isn't it all the afternoon afternoon for you now um and we shall hope to see you see you again soon thank you so much thank you all Take Ciao. Care. bye <laughs> they were saying thank you thank you very insightful very inspirational ciao <laughs> awesome thank you so much guys take care bye michael bye bye, bye.